Howdy, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for showing up, too. You're welcome, I was okay. late. That's yep. fine. <laughs> okay, Louise. Okay, over it. to me. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Louise Chun. I'm the former editor of Psychology's magazine, and I now have a therapy website called welldoing.org. And I'm also the editor of a quarterly magazine called P Planet Mindful. Um, this is not about me, obviously, but this is just to show you that I am interested in the subject, as are all of you, and that's why we're here. Um, let's talk about this book, How to Be Human. I think they the know. Manual. I don't think you have to hold it. All right. I think they can see We're kind of subtle with the, the branding tonight. I like yeah, that. Very subtle. The author is oh, Ruby no. Wax, whose previous two books, <laughs> Say New World and A Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzled, were Sunday Times number one bestsellers, and our fingers are all crossed for next week. Uh, while Ruby is very much the author of the book, she's also involved two others in helping to wrangle this enormous subject. And they are a neuroscientist, Anish Ranpura, who studied molecular... Ashish. Sorry? Ashish. <laughs> Ashish. 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 I said Ranpura. Ashish, didn't I? I don't think Did so. Did I not say... Sorry, Ashish. Let's okay. Bad start. Let's Ashish <laughs> Ranpura. Ash. Ash. Good. He studied molecular neurological biology at UCL and now sees patients as a clinical neurologist in the US and does neuroscience research in the UK. And I feel really relieved I've gotten yeah. through that list. Uh, and close. and, and um, yes, we, we, okay. we've decided that we couldn't go Big on and on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Big Big uh, and then uh, a monk who is Gilong <laughs> Tugten. <laughs> he yes. went from Guess acting and playing jazz piano to being a Buddhist monk at Sami Ling in Scotland. Uh, he's had 25 years as a monk and spent five years in isolated retreats. But at the center of it all is the woman we know and love, Ruby Wax. An actress, a comedian, a writer, she's now best known for her mental health campaigning, which followed her being awarded a master's degree in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy from, excuse me, from Oxford University. Two years ago, she was awarded an OBE for her mental health campaigning. The book, it's good. It's good. this book, good. is taking on a huge subject. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who would have thought? Do you want your name bigger on the screen? It could your, be a little bigger. What's your greatest <laughs> hope, Ruby? For this book, what do you think? Well, to it get will to benefit. number one, yes, well, <laughs> for the there. people reading it. I, I don't. We don't set out for a hope of people reading it. You know, we were together a year and a half. It was a magnificent relationship. I, it was Our a menage a trois to end all menage a trois. <laughs> we met on Twitter, um, not on Twitter, on Tinder. Munker. 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 <laughs> on Munker. Uh, so the, the point of the book is I had a lot of questions and I thought maybe they could help me answer them, which is uh, why are we in the condition we're in? Um, so for example, technologically we're geniuses, no question. You, you can send your thoughts around the world, but as far as understanding your thoughts or how to control them or why they keep you up all night besieging you, we have no idea. Nobody concentrated on the big picture. So you can go in bookshops and there's you know, enough self-help books to be happy that go around the equator about 57 times. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm not saying this is happiness, mm -hmm. but what you know, would just give us peace of mind for two minutes? Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, the book isn't really about mindfulness, except we have a monk. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't about, <laughs> and that's the job. So um, we do go through all these topics to get to the bottom of, uh, how do we understand ourselves so that we can deal better with this bizarre world we've created, which was from cognitive brilliance, no question, but emotionally, we're uh, nuclear geniuses, but you know, emotional idiots. So how did that happen? And so that's what the book's about. And what can you do about it? And we answer those questions. I don't really, but <laughs> I'm there when they do answer it. That's okay. important. Good. I picked them. Does that sound right to you too? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that it's, the reasons we started the book and the reasons we finished the book are, are different. I mean, I think we started the book because Ruby has done a lot of work on the subject and we sort of both felt we could contribute. You know, Ruby wanted to delve much deeper into topics she had addressed before. 
But since doing the book for me, and it may be different because I, you know, I still see patients and, mm -hmm. and, and talk about these kinds of things. I, I think the way that I talk to patients has been different. The way that I talk to my family has been different as a result of doing the book. And I don't know quite what it is, but it's some, something about what w the three of us have contributed individually that's, uh, that's just, I think it's been surprising to all three of us, mm, right? Definitely. Do you well, think it's yeah. changed the way you Has it changed you, Dr. Yeah, and it's changed the way I explain um, the mind and thoughts. Right. Because it's not, uh, it's not always about pushing mindfulness practice. It can just be about getting people to think differently. And so even if they don't want to engage in a formal training, the whole idea of looking at your mind and seeing your, your attitudes and changing that is something. And I'm talking more about that since we worked on this book together. Yeah, it isn't ne ne necessarily um, following one path or another because we're all different fingerprints. Yes. Yeah. But we all do have things in common. We have five fingers. We have two feet, mm. most of us. But, um, but the brain is quite similar. So our biology, if you know a little bit, and it's mm. great material for comedy, mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, what makes a woman choose, uh, you know, a, a beefcake and trainers over, like, the nerd who's just going to give her a good life and watch TV with her? Why are we on this kind of, you know, people are just torn apart by who's the right person? Is yeah. there a right person? Is there... How do I choose that? And it's the, the information is really fascinating. Well, and I wish I had known what I know now. Mm. Well, you, well, tell, tell the well, audience Virgin some of what you learned you through the evolutionary uh, Well, drivers. we'll get back to the, at different phases in women's yeah. cycle. They choose different types of men. So you're good on this. I, I chose well, him because he tells you where it is in the brain. And he tells <laughs> you about the mind, just so you know what the different areas are. I mean, look, basically, I think one of the things that we came to in the book is, and, and, and this is a good model, like, why do we make the choices we make? And there, there are lots of, there's lots of advice that people have had over the years about how we change the way we make choices. But something that seems to be really resonating with people now is talking about it in terms of the brain. Because if you talk about decision making in terms of the brain, then you're free a little bit from the feelings of guilt and responsibility. Yeah, like, you did know, I pick the wrong your partner? Biology. It's your hormones that are, you know, at right. work. So, now, like, you so, can't so, just so say, so, oh, well. So, so what, one of the things that Ruby's yeah. referring to is that we, we, we talk in the book about, like, three systems of, of love, mm -hmm. th three systems of romance. It's a, it's, a, it's a model. I mean, it's... You know, as Niels Bohr used to say, a model is always wrong, but some models are useful. So it's a useful model of love. And, and, and the model is just that there are three types of love. One is based on dopamine, one is based on adrenaline or norepinephrine, and one is based on oxytocin. Mm -hmm. So you have a short-term sexually driven love, which is a norepinephrine love. You have a, an intermediate term romantic kind of Romeo and Juliet love, which is based on dopamine. And then you have long-term pair bonding based on oxytocin. And, and, and what Ruby, you know, what I, so I sort of knew this going in. And what Ruby and Tupton kind of added to this conversation for me was, okay, well, what happens when that sexual urge or the romantic Romeo and Juliet urge, when it wears off, and then people think my relationship with my partner has changed, you know, because it hasn't transitioned over to this pair bonding oxytocin kind of love. And the conversation comes out that I mean, that's really normal for these chemicals. No, really, you know, you don't it's have really, it's really inevitable take it that that will work. It's, your not, because, it's wrong, not because it's not because you chose the it wrong just, person. It's because that's how your biology is going to work. Everybody wants. Yeah. What did you say? You just have to say the chemicals have died. The chemicals yeah. have died. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. End of divorce. Yeah. <laughs> but the the. Uh, the the thing is, if you want to um, have a great relationship, to kind of understand that, that you will end up best friends, uh, that that is coming. But if you want to keep, you know, if you want to keep the high going, the dopamine, for most of us, it's, you're going to run out. So don't okay. point at the guy and say, I'm not, you know, you're not you're doing not it for it. me. Mm. I'm losing it. Mm. Mm. So, um, and it's not going to happen with somebody else. I mean, these are, we're being general here. Right. It's not always cut and dry like that. But it's so interesting. And also that your body makes decisions um, that you don't even think about. Right. You know, thoughts are the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say your body kind of knows genetically who would be the perfect partner in a way because it wants to find somebody to make a kid with a great immune system. Mm. So we're not even aware of it. I was aware of it because I married this guy with length, tall legs, so I could... That's it, Ed. That's all That's you're it. bringing to and, the relationship. A, I'm sorry. That was an unconscious decision. It was then. a conscious you decision. Felt, was I want 2,000 years of short immigrants scuttling <laughs> over borders. I needed some, you know, so I needed big strides. But it's interesting who we, ch who we choose without knowing it. And there's another thing is, depending, if, when the woman is 
ovulating, she picks a certain type of man. When she's not ovulating, she's attracted to another sort. So the lesson is, don't ask somebody to marry you when you're ovulating. Yeah. Wait for it. Yeah. Who are you attracted to what, and tell him why, and then we'll get to you, because well, he's mean, an <laughs> expert on sex. There does, there, 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 there. <laughs> he can tell you everything. There is a re there is a re there's a really interesting relationship here between um, it, so so one way of measuring genetic diversity is you look at a, a component of the blood which has a protein called a histocompatibility. No 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 you're going to <laughs> slow it down. Do you see why he needs an editor? No but it's just no. It's, I know it's interesting. I'm interested. Okay. <laughs> Look, so, so, basically, so basically, there's a, there's, a, there's a diversity of these histocompatibility complexes, and people tend to be attracted to other people who have a very divergent histocompatibility complex. And that's true both in straight people and in gay people and in everybody. So it's not just like this drive to procreate. It's somehow that attraction, the attraction itself, that, seems to be to genetic diversity. Invisible to us. It's some sort of invisible pull, but I mean, it, it, it's statistically, it's more likely but that also, you have a divergent the, the type you're... It sounds like we're being very general, but they do do experiments with women when they're ovulating. There's yes. One, where they smell a, a yeah, certain t-shirt. Yeah, the smell, the smell. The under, a, the un, yeah. yeah, they put and pads under the And they're attracted to very uh, kind of alpha, mm. you know, testosterone-fueled guys. Right. When they're right, ovulating, but, and then mm. when they're not, they'll go for the more feminine feminized guy. Right, right, right. So explain why. But I'll tell you, but that story, I because that know, story gets misrepresented a little bit, right? Because actually, it turns out that most women prefer feminized faces. When they're ovulating, they prefer slightly less feminized faces, but still more feminized so than average. So why is that? Nobody knows. Oh, well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Don't so, say so that. They, so there's we a tell shift, you, We tell you in the, the book. Yeah. We tell you why in the book. Yeah, you got, they got to get the book. They have yeah, to get the so, book. It is but, in the book. Yeah. It's in the book. It's, it's in, in the, the book. book. Yeah. Now, there's, now there's, <laughs> it's also in the book. There's quite a lot about th thoughts and emotions yeah. and how closely interrelated they are. And so many people today seem to struggle with negative thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, what, what is it that we, you know, how is it that we jump to these negative options? Well, that's why I asked him, is there an asshole gene? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. right. So, so you were talking about the error signal. Yeah, but, that, but remember, that was one of the first conversations yeah. that we had when we got together, because yeah. Ruby wanted to title the book The Asshole Gene. Yeah. And so we were like trying to figure out what that meant. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and, and, actually, and you got hung what, up on the whole gene thing. You said it's not really a gene. <laughs> yeah. I got really hung up with trying to explain DNA but for Ruby. But just explain and that didn't, yeah. why yeah. we have a proclivity for the negative. Error right. signal. An error signal. Yeah. Right. So this right. isn't, it, kind of the idea of the book is that it's not your condition, it's the human condition. We have more negative thoughts than we do positive. If we whistled a happy tune, none of us would be in this room, but all of us won the evolutionary hunger game. So give yourself a hand for really getting up pissed off in the morning and feeling like shit. That's the way you're supposed to feel. Okay. Right, right. <laughs> but should we not have evolved to be more we positive? Thought. Because there is so much less so I think, danger so, for us. So there's, there's some evidence that we're more positive than we think. If you Ask, so, so one of the things is that the, the, the limbic system, which is the part of the brain that does emotion, is tightly, tightly wired into the parts of the brain that do memory. So if you ask someone to remember, how did you feel yesterday, they'll tend to remember the memories that were most arousing to them. And the memories that were most, <laughs> I mean, in that sense, the, the memories that activate the brain the most are the negative memories, because they produce this strong error signal. Mm. They suggest to the brain that something's wrong, and it mm. requires focus and attention to fix All a problem. Right. But if so if you're, you're happy, happy yeah. it doesn't require focus and attention. You tend not to encode it. But so, there are these yeah. cool experiments that you can do where you give people a pager, and you, you page them at random times of the day. Whatever time of the day your pager goes off, you have to report your mood at that time of the day. Yeah. Their self-reported mood when they're randomly paged is usually much happier than if you ask them, looking back on yesterday, how did you think you, how did you, what was your mood yesterday? What, what's your feeling about the happy, the, the proclivity to negative? Because obviously, what you do for a living is try to deal with, you know, living with the onslaught of the negative. How do you, you know, how do you deal with it? Well, do you feel like shit in the morning? <laughs> do you? Sometimes, but I know how to change it. But what thoughts Be go through your head? It's more a feeling, and I think thoughts and feelings are very similar. No, no, but do you have an asshole gene? Sure, what's, Okay, so Absolutely. what's your worst, 
self-critical thought. Just give me the top. That I'm useless, I'm not good really? enough, whatever. But these thoughts He don't... once told me that he thought he had a fat bottom. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that. Yeah, and that he would be re replaced by the Dalai Lama if he didn't He's very concerned come up with that. the deals. Yeah. So, so you were talking about this error signal, and you were saying that when you're walking down the stairs, and you notice, yeah. you're just walking down the stairs, and you only notice when you're going to miss a step. So you're noticing the negative, but your mind is taking the positive for granted. It's like if you have a toothache and it's a sunny day, you feel the toothache, you, you don't, you totally, uh, it's taken for granted that the sun's shining. Right. So to me, as a meditator, that suggests that our kind of natural condition is positive. And when we're negative, we're kind of off kilter. And mindfulness is about getting yourself into that more natural state and learning to not grab onto those negative thoughts and emotions. But you're being assaulted in a world where, um, you know, it, again, with evolution, we, are, we were supposed to feel envy, we were supposed to compare, we we're supposed to be aggressive fuckers, you know? We're supposed to, but in a world that we've created where everything's, you know, it's a, it's a buffet of temptation. Yeah. You know, you can't even blame yourself for being negative and being overwrought because that's the world we've created. Now you're in that world, so how do you deal well, with it? Well, the problem is, is that we are completely um, projecting our thoughts onto the external world. So instead of realizing, oh, this is how I'm feeling, or mm. this is how I'm thinking, we're thinking, well, this is how they made me feel, or this is how this made me think. We're constantly projecting. And if you can stop doing that, even if you're not going to practice mindfulness, if you can just stop and say, actually, this is with, within me, and I can change it, which, of course, links with neuroplasticity, that you can change your thought processes, then, then you're freeing yourself. So this was actually surprising. I mean, you know, knowing the biology of it, I still found it, that's one of the things that really changed some things in my life, I think. Spending well, time we meditated together. Yeah, we yeah. meditated together, but also that, that recognition that when, you know, when you feel sad or you've had a bad day or, you know, I'm feeling stressed about my career, I, I, I spend a lot of time analyzing that. Yeah. Well, I, it's because I didn't make this decision or yeah. maybe the next thing I should do is I should write this email. But instead, you know, what Tupton's kind of taught me is you can just observe that feeling and recognize that that's a biological reaction you're having. It may, it, may, it, may, it may or may not indicate what you're supposed to be doing. It may or may not indicate a cause. And but instead of spending ages looking yeah. for the cause, you just notice the feeling. They always like say, it's like when the plane has a crash, everybody thinks inside of us there's a black box. With right. the real, like there's a self in here. Right. And you know what's so interesting, well, I don't want to get spooked, but there is no real, there isn't one. Their there's real self. Box. There's a whole committee up there. There's 1% or something is thoughts, you know, that constant thing, you know, the, the one that gives you the critical thoughts. But your whole, the rest of your body doesn't give a shit what you're thinking. And I you know, it has to grow us, fingernails, yeah. it has to do heartbeats. You're not in charge of that, you know? Yeah. So you're the last person to know. Something happens and then, and actually your emotions come first. You know, you feel, if, if you have to wait for the thought, it comes much later. Mm -hmm. The emergency would be over. We're taught to respond like animals. So. We, it's very hard for us to interpret what those feelings are. So yeah. everything is a little bit yeah. faulty. You know, I don't know when I'm in, uh, you know, I feel something and I don't know whether I'm in love or I have wind. I, it's very hard for me to interpret. <laughs> And, Do you know what I mean? Acid <laughs> reflux, I get, you know, and suddenly I think, I'm going to kill that person. Like, they made me have acid reflux. I just have it. I was born with it. And I think we, we were talking in the book about how you are not your thoughts. So if you're able, like you were saying, to observe your feeling or observe your thought, that part of you which is observing is not experiencing the pain. So you are now observing something and that part is free. Mm. So you're, you're learning to... to detach in a way without becoming cold and lifeless but just have that distance but you'll still have the horror show it's still going on because but you're not buying into it and you're not acting on it yeah but there's a, it's it's so it's interesting like even hearing you guys talking about it now it's it sounds much less radical than actually doing it is because i think before i did it with you mm. i these are things that i would have said yeah yeah of course that's true of course that's true but the first time you do it the first time you know you're really upset or you're really sad and you recognize that this is just brain activity yeah. this is just something my my limbic system is doing i'm going to allow it to happen and i'm not going to spend time ruminating and figuring out the cause I mean, that's a radical act, and, and that, that's, you know, I think that's really cool. That's something that, could, for me, came out of and the book. And so just, uh, what the interesting thing is, yeah, that's the idea. So, because if I can't see it or I can't smell it, it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So what actually, man, make it easy, okay? What yeah. happens in the brain that actually makes it possible for you to do that whole paradigm shift? 
to now oh, watch yeah. thoughts rather than be thoughts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happens in there? But easy, easy. You, you're talking about what happens when you neuroplasticity. Meditate. Yeah, what, when, hap even what happens not meditating, even not meditating? Observing. Right. Where is that observer, and what is it happening in the brain when you are observing? your thought and emotion. What, rather than feeling it? Yeah, rather than being No, you're feeling it. it, but rather than being saturated in it, you could say, it. there is anxiety, I am not anxious. Mm. You know, it's there. So what's so, going on? So there's, a, there's an area in the brain, it's it, it, it called the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. I'm so turned out. Yeah, you it's a kind of, <laughs> I'm so, it's so sort of like there it. above your ear. And, and that area acts to um, basically inhibit the rest of the brain. So you have this loop that goes on. And that area of the brain can start to interrupt this, this loop of recurrent thinking, recurrent cycling. And, and does he exercise that yeah, so you dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex? Yeah, and there's a big difference. In, 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 well, in, he in, has a bigger one. His is more, it's more efficient anyway. Right. It's, 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 but if you it's, put it ends up him a stronger under a influence. scanner. Yeah, it's a big difference. It's a big difference. But, but it's a big difference in Tupton. But Tupton's been doing it for years. I mean, it, it turns out to be a noticeable difference with, definitely within eight weeks. Yeah. Of, even, of a meditative even practice. Even three or four days. There three or four days there start to be some differences. Yeah, which yeah. is very encouraging. But that's also why, you know, when you do it, when you sort of think, okay, I'm, I'm really upset about something and I think it's because so-and-so was rude to me or because I didn't get such and such a grant, you know, you, you start saying, okay, I'm just going to, that's just upset. That's just this, like you used to say, Tupton, I mean, it's like weather. It's yeah. a rainy day. Mm -hmm. You can spend age, I mean, there are, there are reasons, right, yeah. there are reasons it rains, right? Mm -hmm. There's reasons the weather in the mm -hmm. world works like that. But I mean, are you going to spend ages thinking about why it rains or just get an umbrella? Yeah. You know, so yeah. the, the and, idea and, is and just the get the umbrella. And the irony of this is that it's thoughts that make us suffer. That's what's so right. interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world, you know, we blame it on, you know, the global warming and this guy did this and, oh, there's the enemy who changed every half an hour. I don't even know who's the enemy. But it's, it's in the conflicts in here. You're battling it out in here. And then you project it and say, wait a minute, you're making me feel this way. Right. That's why this kind of understanding is really good for kids mm. because then the kid won't always point at the bully and say, you're making me feel that way. He'll kind of be able to take internal temperatures mm. going, oh, my cortisol's in red. He doesn't have to call it cortisol. He could call it whatever he wants. But he and should then, call it cortisol. He, yeah. <laughs> He's a neuroscientist. <laughs> Your son calls it cortisol. My son calls it cortisol. You know, if you want, <laughs> if you want to really laugh, uh, there's a chapter where I ask him how he raises children, it's shocking. and he thought was this was normal. <laughs> Just give us a few examples. What you did to your son? Well, he did. I had him do experiments when he was little. He learned some Latin. Did At he two. Learn his little. hand or something to see how he could count without feeling? Oh, I yeah. wanted to. No, my wife didn't let yeah. me do those yeah. kinds of things. <laughs> what age is, yeah. is your son? What, what he's age? nine now, but oh, he's okay. he learned Latin from age three. And he learned, he started to learn chess. He, I, I remember giving him, I gave him a, a long lesson on quantum Don't physics, listen. like electron shells. Yeah. Because he asked something about. Did you use an electrode? No, he, he, was, he, was, he was four. Mm. And he asked about salt. And he said, what's salt? So, you know, periodic table. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I mean, like. <laughs> kid can't even read. Yeah. You're shoving copper in his face, <laughs> going, we came from the stars. Right. And he's weeping. Yeah. But he's normal, so that's good. His, his mother intervenes a, a lot. Ash was saying to me that, what, what is it if you get a, um, a, an A minus is an Asian. Oh, the Asian B. Is the it, Asian F. <laughs> it's an Asian F. Yeah, the B was the Asian F. Yeah. No, that was definitely true for me growing yeah. up. Yeah. Um, you've, you've got uh, quite a bit about bodies as well in the book and, and the mind-body connection. I wondered if, you know, you feel that there is too much attention now. I mean, it feels like everybody's trying to be terribly healthy and run and, you know, sort of marathons and six-packs and everything like that. Is there any sort of sense that you think that that the mind is is not being paid enough attention to? You've got to, to get it. the two in balance. You exercise yeah, in the conversation the in the book, yeah. it seemed to yeah. me like you there was a bit of skepticism about the too much focus on, on... Well, I think one of the things we talked about in the book was that, you know, and, and this was kind of another one of these really interesting things that came out of the conversation. People go to the gym, but they tend to wear headphones or they watch television yeah. when they're at the gym. Yeah. So they're, they're working out their bodies, but they're practicing dissociation. Mm. During that moment when they're getting their bodies physically fit, they're actively practicing not being in their bodies. Mm. So that becomes a habit. Then every time you use the body, you practice dissociating. Mm. So I don't think that's... I no, think but that's if you, uh, you know, athletes and now martial arts and Pilates and certain yoga, if you're focused in the body... Mindful movement, that's different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, we maybe you don't use that yeah. word, but whenever you focus into the body, immediately the cortisol comes down, the heart beat comes down, everything comes down. So it's another form of, again, observing your thoughts. When you notice, you know, in a, 
do whatever you want. J jog, do Iron Man, though. Why in this, you know, mm -hmm. 2018 do you need to canoe over the Amazon? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or have a six pack when you do when you sit at a desk yeah. for a living. Mm -hmm. Okay, but maybe you'll play xylophone on it later in life. But you know, but 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 but. But, <laughs> but the thing, is, the the question is, um, the question is, the most important thing to train for our future is your attention. Right. And that sounds like such a, like a fluffy word, but attention is what makes us human. Mm -hmm. If your mind, you know, if you're, I, was, I said it before, if you're, if you're on holiday in paradise, but your mind is in the office, get back on the plane because that's where your mind thinks you are. Mm -hmm. So if you can, and for kids and for relationships and whatever, if you can really hone, and you can, just the way you can get a six pack, mm -hmm. that attention, A, you'll have a better life, B, if you pay attention when people are talking, they love you for it. You know, and C, you're teaching kids don't do instant gratification. Really one thing at a time, savor it. And if you do choose to multitask and spin those plates, mm. meanwhile, I've said before, no animal can multitask. Mm -hmm. You've never seen a gazelle smoke a joint and play the piano at the same time. <laughs> no, I know. That's true. But if you want to do it, do it. But the thing is, you become the boss of your head. He says it. Now I'm going to multitask. Now I'm going to burn my brain out because I need to hit a deadline. But now you burn your brain out because I'm pulling back. So it's really learning to, it's like a Ferrari's up here, yeah. and now we have to learn to drive it. And that's what the book's about. Well, there's, one, there's one thing, can I just, uh, the, yeah. one, one thing about in terms of the brain changes in, during meditation, right, or the brain changes in mindfulness. One of the things that's very surprising is that in, in, in experienced meditators like Tukten, the part of the, so right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex changes, it becomes more active. That becomes active in you and me too, though, after just a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. But the d real difference in Tupton's brain is that premotor cortex starts to become very active. And that's a very surprising change. So why, uh, premotor cortex is the part of the brain that readies the body for action. It's sort of action planning. Mm -hmm. So even while just sitting there meditating, Tupton's brain starts to do this action planning. It's, so his ability to then, then act in the world is, is probably faster well, now you're and talking organized. about, yeah. So this is the compassion. It's compassion meditation. Because uh, mm -hmm. there's always this question around if, if monks go to retreat for many years and- what, a, what the hell are you doing what, there? Who are they helping? That was Ruby's yeah. first question. So we, we come so from very similar backgrounds, Ruby. So, so the, the first whole, question is what the hell are you, yeah, what what are the hell you doing? Are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you're not helping anybody. What did anybody. you achieve when but you But the whole idea is that when you're doing compassion meditation, mm. the areas of your brain connected with activity and intention are lighting up, as you said. So when you are, you're building up those pathways so that you can actually benefit others. So it starts with training and then turns into action. But you were saying that even during the meditation, the, the intention centers are getting built. The intention centers, yeah, they get, that's a really and big so then, change. And so then in the book, we're talking about how compassion isn't just kind of like a soppy state of like gooey kind of feeling, but it's actually activity in the world that benefits others. Yeah, but yeah. I, we've jumped to compassion, but you know, if you don't, and again, I couldn't even say compassion. The I call it the C word. The C word. But um, <laughs> because, you know. But you ended up telling a, a great story about. Yeah, but that's your, at the end, but you know. It, uh, no, it's about your computer, and, and that was, that was in, in the compassion one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, it got, an incident kind of got me tuned up to uh, yeah. somebody doing some. I always think, what's the bill? You know, if anybody does something, yeah. I go, wait for the bill. There's always coming in. It's, it, it, there was an incident where there was no bill, so yeah. I got thrown. But that's not really compassion training. Yeah. <laughs> that's no. just going, what the fuck was that? Yeah. <laughs> so um, th we jumped to compassion, but ultimately, um, the reason it's in the book is uh, that's the yellow brick road to happiness, mm. ultimately. And it isn't just because, you know, suddenly, uh, I don't know you feel so that you're so self-righteous, it's because when you do turn on those buttons mm. in the brain, certain, there's, it is a selfish act because you get certain health benefits. Mm. Again, the, immediately, as soon as you feel good about doing something, and you have to do it, you can't just share somebody's pain because now you're in pain. That's the now empathy. they have to jump and worry about your yeah. pain. Yeah. 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 Really but you, you want to do something, for, even if it's just sitting with the person, that's mm. still an action, is that, well, you could, it, the, the health benefits are enormous. Mm -hmm. But again, we weren't born to feel in this world that we've made, you know, mm. and I've made. You know, you always go, how did he get in as president? I voted for him, you know what I mean? Mm. I didn't, but the rest of the human race mm. is off kilter. Mm. Um, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Figure out what went wrong in our brains. If, if there's a politician who's scaring you, chances are you're losing your... First thing to yeah, go down when yeah. you're feeling, I'm sorry, I'm jumping from uh, thing. First thing you feel, fear evokes. Lo what happens is the hippocampus 
burns out, which means your memory burns out. Now you can't associate with what happened in the past. Now he's just kicking in your fight and flight thing. So your adrenaline is going, and we are creatures of mm. addiction. Yeah. Mm. And it sometimes but feels you know, much better I, to be fearful, sorry. So yeah. the compassion I just meant and then is that you have to train for it. Because in this world, it's kind of considered, well, you lose if you're, you know, if you're a little too nice, yeah. you're the loser. Can I, can, I, can I tell a fact about it? Because no, this, Ruby's talking a lot about compassion. And then, so, so we went down to Cape Town because apparently we have to write this book in Cape Town. I don't know why, but we went to Cape Town. Yeah. We need some. We go, so these two are really into like this low carb stuff. So they're in this shop and Tupchin kind of goes off. Ruby and I lost him. I know where him. you're going. And he goes into the shop and he's just like shopping. He's like very excited about these low carb products that they have. So he comes out, he's all excited. He says to Ruby, I found all this low carb stuff. And Ruby looks at it. And, 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 and in Cape Town, they're very respectful of Tupchin because he wears the robes. He looks beautiful. So they're, they're sort of coming up to they him. They don't know what saying, the hell he is. They're coming up to him. They're like, we're, we're very honored that you've come to our store and all of this. And Ruby's like, yeah, that's great. Did you ask for a discount? <laughs> <laughs> in the midst of compassion training. <laughs> That was, so and, he, we, and he didn't ask for the discount. So now she I've was really him. disappointed. Now I've trained She's him. Trained so are we, yeah. can I say it? Uh, I we're writing want, our own book called just, <laughs> act, Wait, wait. Act like a Buddha, think like a Jew. <laughs> now you can do it. That's our next yeah. book. <laughs> you, you mentioned attention about keep focusing and attention and it's it's a bit like the conversation is a very good example of that because we keep going from one to the other That's but i i think is, i it? think one of the one of the things uh, uh great things about a book is that one goes through different sections and deals with everything uh in in its entirety there and on to the next one but of course we're all now being digitally tapped on the shoulder every couple of minutes yeah you know what can we do about that? What is it doing to us and what can we do about that? Well, can I just say that if we sit here and bitch about it or you watch TV shows about it, it's happening anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, in a few weeks, we're gonna look back and say, oh, my iPhone was like a lump of coal. So it's all coming. So now, again, how do the human comes into it? So mm -hmm. how do you navigate? How do you navigate what's coming and use it? Boy, I'm more excited than anybody to be able to order a husband at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm licking my lips. Or the, but the other one, ringing a drone while I'm sleeping and it could shave my legs. <laughs> yeah. You like that one. I love that yeah. one. Yeah. Um, so I, we're embracing it, mm. but how do we keep how this? How do you stay human? How do you stay yeah. human? So you but how do you, how can you actually focus on, on what it is that you want, want to do? You know, that, that's the problem, isn't it? To get, in, get more in charge of your own mind mm. and then you can make choices from inside rather than being so, so affected by the, bombardment of information coming towards you through social media and all that stuff. It's about having more self-awareness. So do you have rules that you apply? Do you no rules. keep your phone outside no, your no, bedroom? No. Do you oh, no, no, no. It's probably in my pocket now. Anyway. <laughs> you know, no. use it when you need it. And then yeah. when you don't, you know, it's all about, again, the internal temperature. Have I hit my tipping point? That's so hard because we, again, forgive yourself, we're creatures of addiction. If you put food in front of us, mm. you know, in the old days, we'd just hunt and then go to the fire, you know, go pick up and the women cook. Mm -hmm. and still mm. very um, women's lib back then too. But um, <laughs> there was a resting point here because everything is tempting you. It drives you to madness, but we can't blame the technology. It's us, it's the thoughts that are the enemy. And, uh, but I think what Ruby's saying about taking your internal temperature is really, it's so, it's so critical because and a lot of what changes in the brain during these processes is the ability to simply ha have, draw your attention to internal states. Mm -hmm. So just noticing that you're inattentive is qu quite a lot of the solution. It's very hard to notice what your level of attention is and particularly to notice when your level of attention drops down, like you start becoming inattentive. That's very hard to notice because by Or your work you're starts to just be blah, 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 blah. You know, that's yeah. what happens. My writing just goes to shit. Yeah. But I keep, because we're creatures that have to keep, you know, uh, yeah. fighting adversity. Yeah. And then I take it out on myself and now the red mist is up and now I can't right. remember. So we get caught in the loop. But you know, what, what, I, but, but what Tupton has said, which, I, which has been really influential on me, is like every time you notice you're being inattentive or every time you notice your attention is less than you'd like it to be, every single time you do that is a victory. Yeah. You know, every mm -hmm. time you do it, you're practicing succeeding at doing it's it. Like lifting so weights. instead of like, the yeah. yeah, so noticing instead of beating yourself up yeah. all the time saying, oh, I was distracted again, mm -hmm. you think, 
actually, I did a good job because I noticed. And, I mm -hmm. and that happens to a lot of people when they meditate, is they beat themselves up yeah. because they're so distracted. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, no, you, you're doing well because you're noticing, noticing you're distracted it. and you're coming back. Mm -hmm. So it's that whole negocentric thing where you think you're doing everything wrong. But just noticing you were distracted is a huge victory. But and then part of your the training is, and this I have a real hard time saying with, is that this is where it's not just about seeing a shrink and saying, punish me, punish me what I've done. It's you're learning to be kind to yourself. Yeah. The minute you do that, then you can see your, fo your foibles clearly, yeah. which we all have. I mean, the shit that goes through my brain every morning, but there's a bit of me trying to train and say, everybody's got this going through their head. Here's why, because in evolution, we needed mommy and daddy to go, look out, there's something coming up behind you. Now there's nothing coming up, but maybe I don't have enough likes. So I go, oh, I'm, you know, or, or I wasn't invited to the party. I feel all this stuff. Mm. It eats me up with envy, but a little me of me says, again, this is not my condition, it's the human condition. Yeah. Mm. It's sort of become a mantra. Mm -hmm. And some things are my fault, you know, and I do want to get invited to the party, but, you know, I, I don't want it to kill me. Somebody said, I love the expression, there's pain is pain, but suffering is optional. Yeah, that's nice. I love that. Yeah. Well, and there was, there was also in the book quite a lot about children and about teenagers. I mean, what, do, what, what you know, things, our thinking about teenage, for example, has changed now, isn't it? That we now realize that, in fact, they, their brains haven't finished forming until they're long after... We used to think, we used to think, you know, 17, 18, off you go. And now it's more like 24, 50. 25. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how, how, is, how does this, what, what are we left with? How do we deal with this? How do, how do we help? I, I think that one of the things with the teenage brain, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of excellent work on the teenage brain. There's, there's, actually, Sarah Blakemore has just published a book. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. Looking at that. Don't it, talk about enough. What, what, <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about her. What's the, book you wanna, the book you want to look at about the teenage brain is called How to Be Human by <laughs> there Ruby is, Wax. There is, there is a section on how to there be There are some other books that are not worth mentioning. No. Um, it's, it's, uh, what, so so, what, so, so one, of, one of the things that's really important to know is that the, teenage, the, the, the brain has mechanisms for being very sensitive to risk and very sensitive to reward. Mm -hmm. The teenage brain is really, really sensitive to social reward mm -hmm. and very insensitive to risk. I mean, it's the kind of thing that you know intuitively by hanging out with teenagers. But yeah. that's just a biological property of the teenage brain. So if you spend a lot of time talking to teenagers about risk, there's just not the, me the, 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 the mechanism is not there. I mean, it's like, it's like the thing with the chicken and the looking sideways. Oh yeah, I said something I don't really, really smart. That. I don't know about chicken. I said don't, but it had nothing to do with the teenage no, you brain. you thing about a chicken. I said, we're, some of us didn't have to do, are just not equipped. You know, it, right. the human, we only have, this goes back to, we Does only it? have the capacity to do certain things. We can't do everything. So you can't as see out human. of the sides of your head. You know, yeah. It, we really can't see out of... Is true that chickens can see out of the sides of yes, their head? Yes, they can't go forward and they can't go backwards. <laughs> okay. okay. So as humans, we can make the choice. We can decide to turn around. Yeah. So that's why we've got a bigger brain than a chicken. Right. It's irrelevant to no, what we're talking about. No, it's not. Because, <laughs> it's not. It's it's because, irrelevant. because the point is, if, if, the, if the teenager do doesn't have the capacity to be sensitive to risk, they biologically don't have... It's not a matter of convincing a teenager that risk matters. The biological capacity isn't there. So it's not, it's a dead end road. You know, you, would, you, would, you don't blame anybody for that. You just wait for the brain to develop that capacity. But, it, but, all, but the important thing is, you, first you understand the lay of the land, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that they don't have something that, you know, the frontal cortex that yeah. says, uh, impulse control, let's watch it, let's plan it before I open my mouth. That doesn't mean you just let it rip. In the book. <laughs> which I've stolen from a lot of people, the information, is how to, you know, once you understand the lay of the land, how to negotiate around it. Right. How to understand that if you uh, read, their, read where they are and then really learn to drop your baggage and really tune into what's going on in theirs. You know, it's curiosity that's going to make that kid flourish. Yeah. To really say, because my mother thought I was a photocopy of her, and she was very disappointed, you know, with the whole, you know, mm. She thought, you know, it was something that, a replica. Mm. So when I opened my mouth at four, it was a big letdown. You know, if you really look and say, who's the kid? Don't force feed them to do something if they haven't got the capacity. Later on, neuroplasticity can kick in and you can make them, you know, say, where's your attention going? Follow their attention, appreciate their creativity. If all they can do is do that, give, you know, appreciate it no matter how small it is. And then... You still have to have boundaries, you know, and really understand 
if the kid sees a chink in your armor, he will, he will drill you till you drop dead, you know, with why, why you can't go out. So you really have to know how to say no and a short explanation and then back off. <laughs> and with kids, you learn things like they have different types of tantrums. One is a top down, one is a bottom up, which is sometimes they're acting it out and they know it's nudging you and other times it's fully limbic, it's reptilian. Mm -hmm. So in the book we talk about different ways, but again, it's always, now you're not just as a parent reading your own temperature, you cool yourself down enough to see the other temperature really clearly. If you're in a state, mm -hmm. if you have to, leave the room mm -hmm. because you can't deal with it when the red mist is up. Mm -hmm. Again, if you just know what happens when you're in fight or flight, when that amygdala is up, you'll start learning how to regulate it. You have to, because once you're in that fight and flight state, you're just, it's toxicity that's coming off of you. And I always love the experience. We work like neural Wi-Fi. The mother comes in, the teacher comes in, the boss comes in, whatever state he ends, it just washes over everybody else. Yeah, yeah. So fix yourself and then go save the world. So that, but neural Wi-Fi, can I just, it's a tangent. It's a tangent. It's, it's all a yeah, tangent. It's, it's go back to the chicken. No, look, but it's, so, it's such an interesting I, idea. I love the chicken. Because, because the, the thing, I mean, look, there, this room is filled with people. There, again, like very, very, there's no animal species that could turn up at the tabernacle at 7 o'clock, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why when so we, we're very good. We're very good at coordinating. We're very good at coordinating on a really large scale. I mean, a lot of that is language and writing, but a lot of that is that we can read each other very well. So we're a highly, highly social herd species. Mm -hmm. And so these things about emotions, they're very, very, they're very contagious. And the more you kind of develop the ability to see what's going on in your own brain and have some control of it, then it's much easier to interact with other people as well, even if they don't see what's going on in their own brain. You're less moved. I think that's what I would say. Yeah. You don't think there's any risk that people become super self-conscious about what's going on in their brain? We talked about that. it becomes more difficult. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, if you're constantly thinking about Are you looking what in? Are you being selfish? Doing, would it make you... Are you being self-obsessed? Yeah, but we're not... It's not about obsess... It's not about looking within and obsessing about this thought and that thought and this emotion because then you're just getting more... Uh, uh, suffering more but it's about being that observer that is not latching onto all of that stuff and then it can go by like, like clouds or like traffic. So it's not that you're analyzing yourself all the time because that is like digging in garbage and just the more you dig, the more garbage there is. Do you know what I mean? You're kind of going further and further into the gunk in your mind. It's more about stepping back and that gunk has less of a hold over you. It's a training, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, when you go, to, again, when you go to the gym, nothing, nothing, even language, it has to be repetition. Yeah. It has to be, you know, you want to, you want to peck, mm -hmm. you can think about it all you want, you mm, better live something. Just the bicep. Peck. That's the peck. I was here. Just here. clarify. I was here peck, but it was an audience, so I didn't want to <laughs> locate peck. And also there's no point running to the mirror after one one yeah. lift and thinking, have I got muscles yet? You've got to be patient, and it's the same with training the mind. You've got to do it and be patient, but the, it builds up. Yeah, so what the exercise, I think, is in the beginning, it might seem a little awkward, just like skiing, you know, where they yeah. scream pizza legs or something, and you what hate legs? it. <laughs> pizza legs. Pizza, yeah. I don't know what it is. I clearly never became proficient at skiing. <laughs> pizza legs. What's a pizza like? We'll talk about it we'll later. It's thing. like a chicken. It's okay. like a chicken. You can't see sideways okay. if you're a pizza. Okay. <laughs> see, it makes sense yeah. to us. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. get out that much. Yeah. No. But, but the training is, you know, you, look, you spend five minutes, one minute, you kind of look in and say, what's my temperature? Okay. You know, you're in a queue. You don't have to sit somewhere on a gluten-free cushion. You're in a queue. You're waiting. Nothing yeah. else is going on. You go, what state am I in? That means when you go in to interact with somebody, you've already taken the temperature. Mm. You don't do it all day. It's an exercise mm. for one minute. Yeah, you don't Eventually, it just goes, I'm sitting here. I'm yeah. talking to my boss. I am shitting myself. But because you've practiced it, you can't just do it on a one-off. You start to go, you're watching yourself kind of shit yourself, do you know what I mean? Right. Rather than you're in it. Mm -hmm. So that means you have time to go, yep, yeah, I'm a jerk, I didn't do, he's going to catch me, I'm a fraud, that's totally right. And if you learn to kind of, you know, whatever you have to do, just start breathing. Or I use, a, you know, when you latch onto a sense like breathing or you feel your feet on the ground, again, it's a trick, your cortisol comes down. And I even latch on to, I know this is weird, a sense always takes you out of amygdala hijack. It mm. always pulls you down. That doesn't mean all day you go around feeling things. No. It means for a minute 
you know, like Arabs use their beads, mm. it's they're splitting their attention so that the cortisol never goes up as soon as you go either to tasting, that mm. you know, even if you're tasting food, your Any thoughts your are still going, mm. but yeah. the, 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 the fury and the paranoia do cool down. So when I'm, somebody's yelling at me, sight is also a sense. So mm. what I'll do is I'll stare at their, like usually their left eyebrow and look at the shape and look at the color and whatever. Immediately my cortisol comes down. They think I'm listening, mm. right? <laughs> they think I'm listening and they're flattered to death. But wow. I'm really like, uh, you know, sending, if you, it's, again, it's attention training. You send your focus away from the, because he's gonna, mm. he's gonna neural Wi-Fi me with, oh my God, he's hitting every button. My parents said this about you and listen, you, back to you. And you get into antler lock. So if you can hold it, that doesn't mean it's not hurting. It's just, you know, you're building a great defense. I mean, it is armor to be able to deal with your biology. It's, our, it's the greatest defense. You know, all we did as humans was we made spears, then we made, you know, the, now we're making stealth missiles. This is now using your brain, and the point of the book is to upgrade your mind as much as we've upgraded everything else. There are ways to do it. We live in a time of neuroplasticity. This isn't wishful thinking. Mm. It's science. And it's the mind. And in the book, you've got at the back. There's a whole section of of things of that exercises can do. you can do to yeah. you know to deal with addiction. Yeah. Which, by the way, now is no longer in the '60s. It was cigarettes and booze mm. and you know whatever. Mm. Now it's shopping. It's thinking. It's getting likes. It's and there's mm. a reason for it. So mm. don't yell at yourself when you're looking for mm. friends. Mm. We don't have the tribe anymore. The world is our tribe. And so, how many is enough? Mm. It's not our fault. You know, I need more and more. I need to compete because that really helped me with the tribe, you know, to get the sexier man or woman. We had to compete. But now I'm competing with a supermodel in Russia. Yeah. Our little brains are still yeah. cavemen and we're swamped by the 21st century. Yeah. So it's not your fault, but you can actually make your mind quite resilient and deal with the onslaught of what's about to come. That's fantastic. Thank you. So, questions for any, for Ruby, a monk or a neuroscientist? Take your pick. Who do you like the most? <laughs> <laughs> In terms of all of your formal mindfulness practicing, um, how much of that would you say is explicitly compassionate mindful practices, or would you say that's coming in kind of more subtly? Who, who are you talking to here? All three of you. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Well, in the, in the book, the exercises which I've um, written, some of them are simply observing your breathing or using your senses, but I've put a moment at the start and end of each session where you create the intention of compassion. So in fact, each session is framed with a feeling of, well, I'm not just doing this for me. I'm doing this so I can become more connected to others. Even in a, a practice that doesn't explicitly feel compassionate, it's framed in that way. I, I went to, it, at Oxford, they didn't really discuss compassion. It really was the neuroscience of um, anchoring the mind and what the, what the results that you see, you know, of a, of a really uh, buffed brain. And that was what was interesting to me. I understand, and, and the book ends with, I wanted it to end with, sorry, forgiveness. I wanted it to end there, but that really was gushy. But then I happened to be, they happened to ask me to do, who do you think you are? coincidentally, so I had something to fill the f forgiveness with because I didn't know what my, pa nobody told me anything, that my father had to escape by a thread to get out of, he had about two days left and he jumped a ship, which was unheard of, to save his skin. So I kind of understand why I also have that anger because he had it his whole life. Like you, you want to go, you already made it to America, it's safe now. But he didn't know that, so he fought everybody like he was trying to escape Nazis. <laughs> And I kind of understand that. So that forgiveness is, oh, I get it. It's always, the epiphany is going, oh my God, there's a reason for it. Every time I go, there's a reason for it. The load is lightened. My mother was the it girl of Vienna. She was beautiful, she studied classics, and she was an economics whiz kid. And at 21, where she looked, she made Greta Garbo look like trash. She has to leave and go to Chicago and work like in a sausage factory. I can kind of see why she was angry. I'm still pretty pissed off because that's not who I got, but I saw the young girl. So just like this book, that's when you feel it. I don't want to run. A, I don't want to live with bitterness the way my parents did. 
it killed them in the end. It chokes you to death. So eventually, for selfish reasons, you start to let it go. I, 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 you know, I'm really bad at it, at um, the, the whole thing. And I, 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 <laughs> I've done mindfulness with these two, which is the first time I ever did these kind of meditative practices. And I, I found it really, really difficult. So the first time I did it, I got incredibly sad. Mm. I felt really anxious. Mm. I mean, so I've been doing it. I've tried to do it more and more. Um, but how is it with your patients now? So that's a big difference. Yeah. I think, okay, so I, I think doctors are generally compassionate people. I mean, the reason you go into this field is that, you know, you kind of want to do something helpful for other people. And I have always found it easy when I'm with a patient. I'm, I'm not distracted. I mean, I do find it very easy to pay a lot of attention because then I feel really like, you know, it, it, and, and, but that kind of gets to this compa compassion versus empathy. Yeah. It's not that I feel empathy with my patients. I don't feel the same that they do. I mean, nobody wants a doctor to come in the room and have a nervous breakdown because it's so bad. You want your doctor to be a little bit like, you know, calm and, 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 and be caring, but not be exactly what you are. And so I think that's something that I've been able to do. And, and that is better with my patients now because I do find that I'm able to be with them in, that, in, a, in a very kind of compassionate way. I'm able to work with them and I'm able to show them how to do that too, particularly with patients with chronic pain and disorders like that. So we've all become nicer people. We're nicer. <laughs> Did you find a difference in gender in terms of um, the neuroscience of how to be human and mindfulness and in terms of the brain, um, a difference between gender and how they were conditioned or no? That's a good question. I don't, I'm not aware of any evidence that there's a real difference in, in, um, in how the genders do that. I'm not really aware of that. Genders do what? Do, uh, what the brain, I think, the, I think the question is, are there gender differences in the brain changes that happen as a result of meditation? Is that? It's just because I work with perpetrators, mostly a, a heterosexual in domestic violence, and um, the conditioning and of how heterosexual male are brought up in this world and heterosexual females differ in. I was wondering if any of that comes into the book and how we're conditioned in terms of gender and how whether we're brought up in a different gender, we're better right. at being mindful. Or is any of that reacting in terms of fight or flight or... Does that make I, sense? I think, I think that... Um, well, I think two things. So first of all, you know, Fetal exposure to testosterone changes some brain circuitry. It changes the limbic system quite a lot. Um, but the way that we react to you know, threat, it, wh whether we become aggressive in response to threat or we become defensive in response to threat, some, some of that is, is kind of cultural as well. I think, I think quite a lot of that is cultural. So the fact that you have a brain that responds to threat, the fact that your brain, you know, your in insular cortex sends off this alarm signal uh, and that makes it hard for you to be present in the moment. It makes it hard for you to regain control over your thoughts. That's probably universal across genders. But, but how it feels with the behaviors that manifest when your insular cortex fires off, maybe that's cultural. Uh, yeah, and then f obviously you're going to have a different experience as a female or the male. Clearly, as a female, a, a lot of times, I don't have to say it, but she will find the, you know, feel the victim. And what's interesting is if she... If you don't understand that that's a habit you're caught in, which it is a habit, it's not your imagination. Stuff really happened to you to make you feel that way. But if you don't become conscious of it, and they, do, they did this with, um, it, it, in research, they put little electrodes on, on the eyes and they, they took a woman and they took a man into a room who they looked, at, looked for first. And the woman who did feel as, like the victim found a victimizer. So yeah. it's again where you pay your attention. Right. If you train yourself, to maybe shift your eyes to something else, your story starts to change. So, of course, females are caught in certain habits, but those habits can be broken to a point. I mean, to a point. In, in, my, in my own research, when I've looked at differences between male and female brains, it's hard to find. Like, if you showed me an MRI of a male brain or a female brain, I mean, it would be very hard to identify the difference. And even if you look at functional activity in the brains, you know, if I look at thousands, I could maybe identify a difference. But if I looked at any one versus any other, I couldn't. Um, is there a danger if you are, as it were, too aware of your thoughts so you are able to make decisions that are perhaps against your evolutionary interests without fully having a kind of developed 
cognitive intelligence to make sensible decisions, that you can actually do things that aren't in your org, your community's long-term interests, and actually get in the way of you functioning well? Is, it, is in a sense, it safer just to go with your instincts than to perhaps make conscious decisions that maybe if you don't have the intelligence to make the right long-term decision, you might go very, very badly wrong because you're doing something that isn't uh, like evolutionarily successful. Uh, well, I, it sounds like you're on a loop tape. You might not be able to make the right decisions. That's kind of female. <laughs> but um, of course you can make the right decisions, but gut instinct is a really interesting thing that we talk yeah. about in the book, um, whether to follow it or whether not to follow it. You just want to go a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of gut instinct I, because, first of all, I think it has a lot to do with the actual gut. There's a, there's a lot of cognitive processing that I think happens in the body, both in terms of like stress responses and in terms of how your digestive system reacts with your thought patterns. So your, your, your gut instinct, what you're thinking of as an instinct, is actually your body doing quite a lot of information processing. Like Ruby said, you know, you're, the part of your brain that speaks to you, that's the last part of your body that's ever aware that of, of, the, of all this processing that's happened before. So you, what feels like gut instinct is actually a lot of cognitive processing that's already happened. But then the, the habit might get in the way. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Is that you, f you feel it, but your thing of saying, yeah, but I'm a victim and I'm not very yeah, smart, yeah, yeah, might yeah. start to override it. So a little bit of this, though the book is not about mindfulness, whatever it is, it's saying, okay, that's how my gut works. My thoughts are going back into that pattern. And it's, again, every time you notice, you're putting the cigarette down. You know, it won't happen overnight. But you notice it, but don't kick yourself in the ass. And gradually, gradually, you'll go, you know, I've heard this tune before. I'm not smart enough. I'm not smart enough. And I'll bet you everybody has that tape in their head right now. And I think it's, it's not that you're using mindfulness for a certain situation and it might go wrong. It's just like you're going to the gym and becoming stronger. You're practicing every day and it's just making you more calm and then your decisions come from maybe a, a more calm place. It's not that you're switching it on yeah. and it might go wrong. It's just who you are through your training. Yeah. Yeah. But I've noticed with mm. Tukten too, I mean, I think Ruby and I, and you do it less than I do, but I mean, I, we, we turn things over, like we chew things a lot. Well, There's a lot be, of chewing. There'd be no book. There would be if no I didn't book. Chew. But I have noticed that Tukten chews less. Like he has, if he has a I difficult problem. <laughs> you know, like I, I think one of the things that I bet everyone in this room has is we, you have this feeling that you, you hear these thoughts in your head and, and you've heard them before. Yeah. It's not the first time you've sort of said, oh, if I'd only made this decision 10 years ago, then this would have happened, right? That, that thought What's is recurrent. What's your uh, asshole thought about yourself? <laughs> oh, God. No, I, I mean, there's, there's loads. But I sort of think, like, well, what if I decided not to go to medical school? What if I decided to go to medical school earlier? What, what if, if I decided what to... Isn't it? Huh? It's the what ifs. It's the what ifs. Yeah. What, it's the what ifs. Like, why didn't I make that decision? You know, in, 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 what, there's loads of decisions. Yeah. Um, but I think what, when I see you making decisions, you, you struggle with the decision while you're making it. But I've never, I mean, we've known each other for a couple of years, but I've never known you to like then go back to the past and dredge up that decision you made six months ago. You kind of do struggle, but then having made a decision, you move on from that decision. And that's what I'd like to do. I mean, I, I can't do that yet. Well, do you think you that's know. because he, he's a meditator? I don't know. Well, he wasn't born like this. You know, no. he didn't come yeah. out in a red nappy. <laughs> <laughs> and, he was a, and he was a wild he was boy. Right? He was piano. a wild man, this yeah. one. He oh, yeah. was, you know, he tried it all. Oh. Yes, we've tortured him to go into detail. <laughs> and when he was 14, he and his uh, teacher at school, yep, we won't ask what the relationship was. They would play in jazz bars. He plays piano. And she sang things like Girl from Ipanema yeah. in a slinky red dress. Yeah. And they were going to run away together. It gets really good. Yeah. And they got caught. Uh, <laughs> And then his. He's very dramatic. Yeah, but that's what you said. It's in the book. <laughs> no, but it's in. It's in look, I mean, because it's, it hasn't been that, it hasn't been easy for you. It's not like this was just automatic. Yeah, like he wasn't. Someone for whom I this mean, is just. When I was in that retreat, I was in hell for two years. I was battling with this kind of demonic mind. So. It's not an easy path. That said, we, we, Tupton and I managed to convince Ruby that because we were Indian, this, we were really good at this, like just genetically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good at what? Did, did all of this, mindfulness the whole and thing. knowing about oh, yeah. mental and life. Yeah. Cooking. Cooking, all of it. <laughs> Cleaning my life, house. So got yeah. <laughs> I've just finished reading Matthew Walker's book on why we sleep. And I'm sure sleep is in your book, but I've read, I haven't read yours yet. 
And uh, I read his book, and I think I'm in love. I don't think it's wind at all, but um, I What's think I'm in love. What's the last you just said? I'm in love, having read his book, but um, with both sleep and and possibly the author. Um, <laughs> and I would urge everyone to read it. And I wonder if you could just say a word about the relationship between sleep and the kind of sleep deprivation crisis that we're in, and uh, mindfulness and the uh, ability to both practice and practice. Well, definitely, if you meditate then your sleep improves and in a way you also need less sleep um, it's a kind of deeper rest in many ways you know when you're when you're asleep you're dreaming you're tossing and turning in bed but when you're in that mindful state you're getting a deeper rest wouldn't you say kind of chemically in the brain you're well i mean i mean you need me, sleep like, how, you need how, sleep how but, many pe i'm just curious like yeah. how many people in this room in the last let's say two months have not been able to sleep because you have thoughts going to your head yeah right Okay, so I think that answers the question. Yeah. I mean, it's a, there's a very, very tight relationship mm -hmm. between rumination and sleep. Yeah. But as far as sleep, you know, that circadian cycle, they say that, um, uh, what's his name? Um, he's a professor at Oxford, says that they w they'll be able to, usually they think because you don't sleep, mental, health, mental illness comes on. Now they're starting to think the sleep deprivation is the cause of the mental mm -hmm. illness, that you can actually see your patterns start of sleep, you know, when you don't sleep enough or your cycles are off, that's the cause of maybe some of these mental illnesses. And they say, especially for kids, they're not supposed to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock. It's not in their cycle. Also with an alarm clock, which means you're being shocked to wake. Yeah. So it's a whole kind of shock to and, the system. And people up used that. to say, like Margaret yeah. Thatcher, only slept two hours. Well, right. duh, what look what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to sleep as long as you can. <laughs> As long as you can, really. We should show off and go, you know what? I slept right through your, you know, thing. <laughs> I missed work today because yeah. I was asleep. We should get rewarded. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you about disassociation and the kind of connection between that and mindfulness. Because when you talk about witnessing something, you're kind of like stepping back. How do you differentiate between disassociation and the mindfulness practice? Because there's obviously a difference between the mm. two. What do you think that difference is? Compassion. So, so if you're stepping back and disassociating and trying to kind of separate yourself and going blank, of course, that's not the, that's not the aim. But the whole uh, practice is around compassion towards your own mind. So a thought comes, especially if it's a negative thought, and you're looking at it and you're not latching onto it. But when your mind wanders and gets stuck in it, you un untie yourself in a compassionate way. You don't push it down, you don't hate yourself for it, you just come back to the breath, for example, with gentleness. So that compassion is built into what you're doing and then you're not going into a kind of disassociated state, wouldn't you say? And, and, yeah. and the other thing is, you know, the thing, our biology, our evolution, it's not your fault, in a way, that, you know, you, when you have a happy thought, bring out the champagne, but usually people don't give themselves points yeah, when they do. Really right. They are in there. Yeah. Mm. Um, maybe you have to exercise, I guess, weeding them out of the dirt. But um, uh, it's, it's maybe another exercise is noticing, you know, they, they do that where they've done research, they show people faces on the screen, and most people see just yeah. pick out the sad faces. Yeah. And then through training, they force them to pick out the faces that are smiling. And that also goes in the street. You will automatically, I, you know, will go look at the people who are smiling because, again, with neural Wi-Fi, even if they don't know, you're picking it up. Yeah. And yeah. maybe, you know, don't smile back because they'll think you're insane. <laughs> but just, you know, try to intentionally throw your focus to people that are, I think they call them heaters rather than people who suck your energy. So, again, suckers, suckers yeah, <laughs> blood suckers. Just, again, it's, it's taking hold of that attention muscle. If you can do that. That's, to me, happiness, instead of that fluffy word. Do you know one of the things that I think is, is to me, been really interesting about working with Ruby is that we... What's that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, but, 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 but we, we, we laughed a lot writing yeah. the book, and I think the book is really funny. Yeah. And I've noticed tonight, you know, like at this moment when I'm talking, there's a, you're all having a hundred different thoughts. I mean, everybody's mind is in a different place, but at those instances when we all laugh, we're absolutely all thinking exactly the same thing. And th th that, that's such an interesting thing about the shared, the shared laugh. It's the only time when you absolutely know what's 
someone else's mental representation is. Yeah. And, and it's very embodied, it's very grounded, it's very in the present mm. moment. Um, and so one of the things that to me makes this book really different than other books that cover topics like that is that it's, it's funny. And at that moment, you know, you're reconnecting with, with us. So the message goes in deeper because it goes in deeper. It's much humor is the medium for communication. Well, your mouth is open, you know, because and then you can just put in anything, <laughs> <laughs> as I say. Yeah, that's your thing, right? That's the that's if that's, one, that's the catchphrase. If they're laughing, steal <laughs> their pants. Last question, please. Uh, and you said when you went on the retreat, then you first started meditating, that you felt awful for about two years. I just wondered what you learned from that and so what that would teach us if we're going to really get into meditating and mindfulness, you know, if it's we're going to feel it's bad It's about for a forgiving bit. yourself because for two years I was very depressed and I felt like a failure and I felt like there was something wrong with me and I kind of hated myself for it. And when, when I learned to, uh, and we talk about this in the book where you, you move closer to your emotion with compassion and you forgive yourself for being like that, the whole thing starts to change. So it's about compassion towards your mind state. That's what changed it for me. Did you, like, were there demons and then suddenly, I mean, did it happen like that or did you wear them down? No, it was more like a, a shift because when I was very unhappy, I was finding it impossible to meditate. So, of course, I was kind of sick and not taking the medicine uh, while being surrounded by the medicine. And when I started to meditate more diligently and also learned how to stop pushing this feeling away, but instead become one with it, it changed. It, it's like, it, and I think chemically what happens is it starts to release endorphins because it was a, a pain in the body and you start to relax into it and then it starts to shift and you feel joy. And I think there's a chemistry there, isn't there? There's a, there's a, there's a lot of chemistry um, between kind of emotional pain and physical pain. Mm. They, they really, really overlap. Yeah, um, yeah and I think that uh, it, it, that, that, that practice of separating yourself from the pain, of, of seeing it as like a, a thing that's happening in your brain mm. rather than happening in you, mm. I think it, it shifts both. Yeah. Compassion. So it's mm. forgiveness and compassion is the key. And buying the book. And buying the book. Yeah. That's very important too. And on, that, and on that note, yeah. <laughs> and on that note, can I thank you all for coming and thank say you. thank you to Ruby, Ash, and Debra. And also, <laughs> sorry, touch him. Sorry. <laughs>